questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. Curse on you. The Extraordinary is the day a witch came into the life of music executive Christopher Case and scared him to death. I firmly believe that he died of fright. It is the premonition that allowed actress Jane Seymour to save her baby daughter from certain death at the bottom of her swimming pool. I ran out and I didn't hear a single cry or anything, but something told me go. And I jumped into the swimming pool and she was right at the bottom. It is the one-in-a-million gust of wind that turned bad luck into a big win for two racecourse punters. Back so when I, whoa, whoa. Where's the ticket? Where's the ticket? Oh, my God. Where's the ticket? The extraordinary is the triumph of a mother's love for her son. Doctors said she was wasting it on a boy who couldn't see, hear, or feel her love. They were wrong. How long had you been waiting to say I love you to your mother? Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight on The Extraordinary. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. Christopher Case was scared to death. Yet he wasn't the kind of man to spook easily. He was rational, a leader in his field, a conservative man whose life seemed to be as ordered as his neat apartment in Seattle, Washington. But he met a woman on a business trip to San Francisco, a woman who delved into the supernatural, a woman who called herself a witch. And she did scare Christopher Case to death. That final night, he set up his defense lines about midnight. He had the meticulous care of a man who believed every placement could be the difference between victory and defeat. By now, Christopher Case had come to believe he could survive the night only by encircling himself with religious items that would ward off the evil spirits. After carefully positioning eight large candles around the perimeter of his bathtub, he placed crucifixes and crosses between each candle. While soft religious music filled the rooms of his apartment, he lit the candles. Then. In the safety of his empty bathtub, he lay back to wait out the night. Christopher Case was 35 years old, an average intelligent man, an executive programmer with the Muzak Company, which provides the soft music that plays in elevators all over the world. He was single. He had good friends at Muzak's headquarters in Seattle, Washington and back home where he grew up in Richmond, Virginia. Case was healthy to the extreme, a fitness zealot who took daily vitamins and looked after his body. The worst anyone could say about him was that he was sometimes a bit of a loner. He'd been a disc jockey back home and often he'd prefer to listen to his favorite music than socialize at night. One of the reporters who covered the story was Louis Corsoletti of the Seattle Times. What intrigued me was the fact that, from everything I knew, from what I had been told about him, he was a pretty level-headed guy. You were in your car, listening to... A good friend from his DJ days in Richmond, Sammy Souder, is still in shock at what happened. One of the reasons I get emotional about it is because I, you know, I, he was my friend and I love him and I didn't like the way he died. Case would travel around the US and the world with his job, so he didn't date much. But women liked him. The kind of guy you could rely on. 
everybody's friend. Nobody who knew him can understand the week in the summer of 1991 that ended in such tragedy. Case had gone to San Francisco on a business trip that week. A male business friend, he told Sammy, had introduced him to a woman who was importing rare music from Egypt. She had some information on ancient Egyptian music, and of course music was his life, so he was very interested in that. But Case would later say there was something strange about the dark-haired woman. She had a special intensity about her. It was obvious to Case that she wanted to start a relationship with him. She was older than he was, and she was enamored of him. And he didn't like that. He had no interest in her whatsoever other than the music. Egyptian music has always fascinated me. Um, it's passionate. The second time they met to continue discussing the Egyptian music was in a restaurant. Look at me. Take me home. Tonight. This time, the woman came on even stronger. Now. Case pulled away. Look, uh, why don't we just leave, all right? Take me home. Look, th you're really scaring me. His withdrawal seemed to anger her. Then she said something strange. You will be sorry. I'm a witch. She told him she was a witch and that she was going to put a curse on him. A curse on you. Case returned home and for a time dismissed the incident the way anyone would. He spoke to Sammy without undue alarm. And he said, this lady that I met said she's a witch. And I said, baby, just bless her and go on about your business, you know. This was the first of three calls. They would become progressively worse until the night of Wednesday, April 17th, when he would lay out the final scene of his life. It had been less than a week since his meeting with the woman who described herself as a witch. By his own account, in messages left on Sammy Souder's answering machine, he had not heard from her again. I am a witch. Yet the curse she put on him had started to play on his mind. And it was horrible. I wish there was some way that people could hear what I heard in his voice and what he said. It was a living hell. It's my understanding that these attacks occurred at night on him. And he would try to sleep, but he had gotten to the point that he was not sleeping. On Tuesday, Case visited a religious bookstore called Evangel Incorporated, not far from his home. The store manager, Rodney Higuchi, took particular notice of Case. He came in, asked where the crosses were, and I saw him collect quite a few in his hands. So I asked him what he was going to be using them for, and he mentioned at that time that he was battling some uh, supernatural forces, and he wanted them for protection. He wanted to know if they had been blessed with holy water. I just don't know what to do now. I can't sleep. This was also the day Sammy received her second call from her friend. It's like they're putting the thoughts in my head before I can even think them. He said, they've attacked me in the middle of the night. And he said he had small cuts on his fingers. And he was very, very afraid. I'm in trouble, Sammy. I'm in deep trouble. Between his religious purchases and his calls, Christopher Case had begun a ritualistic fight back against the curse he believed was upon him. He scattered the crosses and crucifixes through his apartment wrote notes on methods of combating evil spirits and spread salt in the corners of each room. His health began to suffer. He hadn't shown up for work in two days. He told worried friends about the curse he believed was taking hold of him. It was this night he became so scared he left his apartment and checked into a nearby hotel. I started calling him about 3.30 my time. And I couldn't get an answer. And that concerned me because he was very, very frightened. The 
forces that would lead him to his final ritual of desperation had clearly changed Christopher Case from the normal man everybody knew and liked. Sometime Wednesday, he had gone back to his apartment. He scribbled more notes on rituals for fighting the curse. He spread more salt, not only along the extremities of every room, but in large piles in each corner. By the time the religious store owner Higuchi saw him on Wednesday, Case was a different person. When he first came in, he wasn't um, very agitated. And so I thought, well, this is a, a significant concern for him, but nothing looked out of the ordinary. When he came in the second time, and he looked very exhausted and, uh, and worn out, um, then I realized uh, it, it was affecting him more than just mentally. I mean, it was a physical thing he was going through. When I talked with him on Wednesday morning, my feeling was he was ready to die. Because he said to me, he said, you know, I can die from this. Shortly after 8 o'clock Wednesday night, Sammy Sauda called the Seattle police with grave concern. Case had not answered his phone all day. Homicide detective Larry Peterson. King County Police had received information initially to make a welfare check at the house. They had made a welfare check on one particular day, I believe the 17th of April, and found the house to be secured. Two police officers went to his apartment door but did not enter. The outside of the apartment had a poured line of salt on the ground running from the front door to the rear of his apartment. Neighbors told them Case was a private man and his front door was locked. They decided not to break in. We turn to our Heavenly Father and pray to him. Sometime that afternoon, Case had gone to a priest in desperation. Father James Malahan was disturbed by his condition. He could feel this uh, malignant power uh, influencing his body and he was scared to death that it was going to kill him. And when Sammy Souter got home that night, the last words Christopher Case ever spoke were on her answering machine. Hi, Sammy. This is Christopher. Uh, well, they just about got me. Medical experts say the uh, apparent calmness of Case's voice is the most chilling aspect. The total acceptance of his fate. Final submission. You know, they're trying to, they are, they are trying to kill me. So whatever it is I do to defend myself doesn't work anymore. That's what it's coming down to. Uh, I'm not looking forward to tonight. It's, uh, it's serious. It's very serious. Uh, it's my life. All the next day, the 18th of April, Case's phone rang and rang. Sammy's phone calls went unanswered. After receiving a call from dispatch, I made a welfare check on Case. The police arrived to check on Christopher Case at 3.38 Thursday afternoon. The apartment was a mess. Scribbled notes littered the living room. More salt had been spread along the floors. I heard soft religious music playing on the radio from the living room. A flicker of light came through the bathroom doorway. As the officers entered, they came across the final frozen moment of Christopher Case's life. The candles had burned down. He was kneeling in prayer. I saw the victim slumped over on his knees with his head resting on the edge of the tub, left of the faucet against the wall. A trickle of cold water ran from the tap. He was still wearing his glasses. He had died sometime during the night. The Seattle coroner officially ruled his cause of death as cardiac arrest. But the people who knew him and spoke to him that final week believe there is more to say. I firmly believe that he died of fright. My guess is that he just had a, he was scared to death, literally. Whether Christopher Case was cursed or merely believed he was cursed, that week in the summer of 91, something or someone drained him of his life.
Coming up, three events in the life of actress Jane Seymour that she cannot explain. One that saved her baby's life. I remember declaring quite, quite openly and loudly that, uh, that atheism was out and I did believe in a higher power, <laughs> definitely. Locked in silence for 28 years, a son returns his mother's love. When they thought I was retarded, I wasn't. And bad luck turned good by a freak of nature. The wind was no good for us because we didn't have the ticket, so we had to go and look for it. British actress Jane Seymour divides her time between Hollywood stardom and a very simple home life with her son, daughter and stepdaughter. She's a pretty down-to-earth lady. But when we talked to her between scenes of her latest TV series, she told us things about a whole other side of her life. Richard. This is Jane Seymour in a scene from the movie Somewhere in Time, the story of lovers separated by time and space, but who find each other in eternity. Jane's starring in a more down-to-earth TV show today, a top-rated series called Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, about a female doctor in the American West in the 1800s. What are you doing? We need to keep the legs healthy. We have to keep the muscles strong. It's a role with special meaning. Seymour's father, a doctor, passed away two years ago, and she clearly feels his presence on set. Every time I work, you know, I, I get weepy, actually, when I think about it, because this would have been, this would have been a big deal for him. He would have loved this. He's right up his alley, because he used to take me when I was a kid to um, uh, the museum, the medical museum. You're making me cry now. <laughs> I used to go to the medical museum with him, and he used to show me instruments from uh, the 1800s, and, and that's what we used to do for fun, you know, and that's what I now do for a living. In fact, there's much about Jane Seymour that seems to put her in contact with events and feelings beyond everyday life. Three incidents stand out. The first happened when she was a teenager, a premonition. I had a boyfriend and we were going to go out and go away from the parents and actually have some fun one night and we really wanted to go and I just had this vision that something terrible was going to happen, that there was going to be a car accident and I told my boyfriend, I said, you know, I'm crazy, I must be because I just, I know this is going to happen. And we stayed home and we were bored to tears. The next morning we were woken up by his parents who said something terrible has happened. You know, there was a terrible car accident. And the car rolled over three times and landed two feet from the edge of a precipice. And they're all beaten up. They were all, they've all broken bones, but they're all alive. And uh, they say that if there'd been any, even one other person in the back seat, the weight would have tumbled her. An even more dramatic premonition, she says, saved the life of her two-year-old daughter. Katie, my daughter, was maybe two years old, and I just had the sixth sense that something had happened to her, and I was in the shower at my house, and my house had a swimming pool in the courtyard, and I climbed out of the shower absolutely naked. I mean, anyone could have seen. It was not my way at all. I ran out, and I didn't hear a single cry or anything. Just something told me, go. And I jumped into the swimming pool, and she was right at the bottom. And I pulled her out, and what had happened is she'd been left with her little three-and-a-half-year-old sister but sitting by the pool while the nanny went to the bathroom. And I pulled her out, and she was fine. Seymour's third brush with the unknown left her absolutely convinced there is a higher power. I was uh, playing Maria Callas in Anassis, and uh, I got a, a bad flu. And it turned into bronchitis, and the doctor came to see me. And because when you're filming, they don't like to lose any time, you know, the normal recommendation by the doctor is at least a week to two weeks rest. Uh, for me, it was, we need her tomorrow. So, you know, out came the injection, and they shot me up with something that was supposed to make me better instantly. And uh, they hit a vein, or, you know, something like that. I, I can't remember exactly. All I know is that um, anything you if, you, if you inject something that hasn't been aspirated, in other words, the air hasn't been taken out, into a vein, 
that can shock the heart, and that's what it did. It shocked my heart, and so my heart suddenly went a million times a minute, or at least that's what it felt like. I had white lights, and my throat closed up, and then I lost consciousness, and I remember seeing a white light, and I really wasn't panicked, um, but I, I knew I didn't want to die, and I knew that that was, was what was happening. I remember seeing myself from the ceiling. I, I saw a view of myself right down at an angle, like, like sort of as though I was on the, on the ceiling of this room. And I saw all these people there suddenly. I didn't remember seeing them. They had injections going in my body, and they had, you know, everyone was panicking. And, and then I remember coming back. Whatever they gave me, the antidote uh, brought me back. And then after I was completely well, then I broke down and started crying. I was really shaky, really upset for many days. But while it happened, all I could think about was my kids. I just wasn't prepared to leave my kids, and I wasn't prepared for anyone else to look after my children. And uh, I remember... I remember declaring quite, quite openly and loudly that, uh, that atheism was out and I did believe in a higher power, <laughs> definitely. There are few things more powerful in this world than a mother's love. It endures tragedy, disappointment, heartbreak, and indeed finds strength in the challenge that fate sometimes throws in its path. This is the story of a mother's love for her son. When every doctor and every logic said she was wasting it on a boy who couldn't see or hear or feel her love, she kept loving and showing it for almost three decades. Just in case he could sense it. And ultimately, it would be revealed. He had heard every single word, felt every gesture. In his mind, he could talk, but nobody could hear. He could respond to humor, ideas, and love, but nobody noticed. He was locked in a personal hell of silent, solitary confinement. Deep inside the private world of Arthur Benjamin Wold, a grievous human tragedy unfolded for 28 years. His world was encased by a barrier of silence and misunderstanding so profound, we can only look back on those years now with a sense of epic loss. Arthur's loss. For he could not tell us what he wanted us to know and our loss, for Arthur had much to give, great wit, intelligence, uncanny perception, strength, and eloquence. When he finally communicated and we were privileged with his thoughts, he told his life story. When they thought I was retarded, I wasn't. When they thought I couldn't learn, I could. When they thought I wasn't listening, I was. When they thought I couldn't read, I was teaching myself. I wanted to tell everybody that I was smart. I dealt with it by trying to realize that they didn't understand. I always prayed that someday they would. It was a life of isolation. I was pretty much tied in knots. Just waiting was all I could do. Arthur was four years old when his parents, Sid and Phoebe Wold, sat in the office of a psychiatrist at the University of Washington in Seattle and heard the words they feared. I think I need to tell you that he's not really going to be able to communicate. They had known Arthur had disabilities, but this was devastating. The psychiatrist described their blonde-haired boy as severely retarded, understanding little of the world about him. With something that's even below mental retardation. He would need special care for the rest of his life. And they told us, well, that your son is mentally retarded and there's, he only has uh, the capability of about a three-and-a-half-year-old. 
I had a feeling with Arthur that there was something, something was wrong, but didn't know what. And I think that was like the other, when we were told he was severely mentally retired, it was sort of like the other shoe dropping, that, all right, I suspected something was wrong, now we know something is wrong, and there's nothing you can do about it. Sid Wold was a gardener. Phoebe was a full-time housewife and mother to Arthur and his older brother and sister. The suggestion little Arthur might be institutionalized was dismissed immediately, but the future scared them. You know this child is never going to grow up and be independent like your other two children. You look forward, your other children are going to be able to finish school and become adults, but this person will always be dependent on you. They walked hand in hand with their son from the doctor's office that day in tears. You can get very angry because why should this happen? And then I guess not why should it happen to me, but why should it happen to him? Arthur, for all his obvious handicaps and his inabilities to communicate, had always been the laughing, smiling boy, the joy in the Wold family. For the next 24 years, Phoebe would agonize over her inability to communicate the extent of her love with words. Arthur simply wouldn't understand, nor be able to tell her what he felt. They enrolled him in a day school for the mentally retarded and tried to have him taught sign language. They read books with him and included him in on all family conversations. No matter what the doctor said, Phoebe had a sense somebody behind her son's unaware expression was listening. I always felt that Arthur understood a lot more that was going on around him than he could express. He wouldn't always respond if you asked him to do something, and I, I could get very angry and then hate myself afterwards for shouting at him because I did shout at him. I'd say, Arthur, why can't you do that? You know, it'd be very frustrating, and I imagine he got very frustrated. There were even occasional faint signs of understanding. In a store, he would seem to recognize the face of a former teacher. I I'm so sorry. Oh, that's OK. I was one of Arthur's teachers. Arthur. Arthur, that's great. Sweetheart, you recognize your teacher? He seemed to know and become saddened when his favorite Aunt Swanee died. But something very sad happened. And I said something to Arthur. I said, you know, Aunt Swanee died, Arthur. We won't see her anymore. And he did say very distinctly, Swanee died. And he never asked about her after that again. And I thought, he knew. He understood. The different colors. There were small hints of Arthur's awareness. But they bolstered Sid and Phoebe's determination to include him in on all family outings take him to church every Sunday, even take him along on a trip to England. Yet at home, the sad truth was that Arthur would seem to forget what he was doing during a simple chore like setting the table. It's in the drawer by the sink. Remember where it is? By the time Arthur was 18, he was a likable, lanky student at a sheltered workshop for the disabled in Seattle but he was alone in the shadows of his private world, unable to communicate or share his thoughts. Nothing he said made sense. Inside, he was developing a sad, empty personality that occasionally broke out in anger and apparent frustration at the long, wasted days and nights of his life. The doctors had long since given up on him he would never get any better than he was. Phoebe could only pray that her author would at least find peace and some joy inside his private world. She prayed daily for another 10 long years. It was a comfort when a young social worker named Carol Crane joined the workshop as Arthur entered his late 20s. He seemed to like her. They danced to music sometimes. Arthur came to like music very much. And then in September 1991, something happened. 
Sid and Phoebe Wold had been away on vacation together without their children. And when they returned, there was a message from Crane. Let me check the messages. Okay. Mr. and Mrs. Wold, this is Carol Crane. Please call me. I've got some very important news about your son, Arthur. I can't go into it over the phone, but I've got something pretty amazing to show you. I think so. Carol talked to us first, and she said, I need to tell you about Arthur. And she sort of, she admitted later, she said she was very nervous. She was scared to say anything. And I think she really sort of blurted out. She said, you know, your son is not retarded. He can read. They watched Spellbound as she sat their son in front of a computer terminal. On the screen, Crane typed the words, how are you feeling today? Then they watched as she raised Arthur's right hand in support above the keyboard. They saw their son's shoulder hunch forward, a frown of concentration form on his brow. With Crane's support, he slowly lowered his finger to one letter at a time. First, the letter I. Then painstakingly, I feel happy because now I can tell mom I love her. Tears ran down the faces of Sid and Phoebe Wold. Phoebe embraced her son with a joy and understanding she had never dreamed could be realized. You could hardly not cry. I know Arthur was just sitting there beaming. I don't know what Sid was doing. He was sort of standing there in shock. <laughs> I think Carol was even crying a little bit. She was so excited. What Crane had brought to the Wold family was as miraculous and wondrous as it was simple. A language, a communication. The program had originated in Australia several years earlier. It's called facilitated communication. Not quite as easy as it looks. It requires delicate yet strong support for a hand that cannot control its own movements. And in the following months, Phoebe herself learned to master it with her son. Together they have, in Arthur's words, opened the window to the lost years in the shadows, to Arthur's 24 years of love he couldn't express, to an undiscovered intelligence and wit that was locked away for half a lifetime. In a moment, we'll have a conversation with Arthur Benjamin Wold. Arthur Benjamin Wold was taken prisoner by cruel fate the day he was born. He heard, he saw, he understood, but his disabilities left him with no way to communicate. Today, through the process of facilitated communication, he can converse by computer, and the thoughts of 30 years flow freely. What was it like, Arthur, when you finally were able to, to do this? I was released from silence. <laughs> released from silence. You know, you're very poetic. You write like a poet. What was it like when you couldn't communicate? It was like trying to be alive and trying to talk to myself. It must have been very lonely. Yes. I think we were too afraid to talk anyway. We were afraid of getting the words wrong. You were? I can understand that. That must have been scary, too. I don't know how you can understand. He's abso you're absolutely right. I can't. 
I can understand scary. I can't understand how it was scary for you. But I'm learning, I'm learning how to ask these questions. <laughs> I don't mean to be rude. You're not. <laughs> what did people think was wrong with you? They thought I was mentally retarded. How did that make you feel? I was very sad and angry. What did you do about your anger? I hit out and sometimes screamed. You weren't angry at them that they couldn't understand you? No. I think it was an honest mistake. Do you remember the first time you were able to talk to your mother on the machine? Yes. What did you say to her? What did you say to her? <laughs> I told her I loved her. What did that make you feel? I'm crying. <laughs> How long had you been waiting to say I love you to your mother? What would you like to do, Arthur, if you, if you could do it? I want to try living out in the community. I want to have my choice about what to do and see and learn. Any question in your mind that he's the one that's writing this out? None whatsoever. I mean, you're not guiding his finger no. there, right? What do you write? None. <laughs> <laughs> now you're speaking for your mother. That's very good. It's my mom. It is your mom. Sometimes my mother. when he my mother. gets tired. So did you, no, okay. did you just hear it? Right. You then said, my mother. What about the questions that I've been asking? Have they been silly? I think we're a good team. You leave me speechless. <laughs> you really do. And I'm not someone who is speechless that often. For a lifetime he was imprisoned, his thoughts and knowledge given no outlet. Today he has emerged from the long silence and few words were ever communicated with such eloquence. We've all had our share of good and bad. Sometimes we think others have all the luck, but over time it probably evens out. In this story, I'm not sure if you'd call what happened to Bob and Steve luck or something else. Watch closely. It's every horse racing punter's worst nightmare. Back a winner, then discover you've lost the ticket. Lost your only proof that you had a winning bet. Bye-bye winnings. That's exactly the awful fate that befell Steve and Bob on a day out at Sydney's Rose Hill Racecourse. But their bad luck was turned to good fortune by a one in a million freak happening. Me and Bob came out to Rose Hill Racecourse one day, best racecourse in the world, and uh, we backed this winner, Ramlay. So far, it was a day like any other, but fate was about to take a hand. Little did they know, Bob and Steve's big win had just been thrown to the wind. Go! Go, your beauty! Go! 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 Hey, hey, you beauty! We're back the winner! 
Steve and Bob's horse had come in. Now, where's that ticket, Bob? Come on, hang on a sec. It's in this pocket. Come on. Oh, you've lost the ticket. Oh, God. Oh, God. What are you going to do? A few hectares of racetrack, a few thousand tickets. It could only end one way. You've had a big win, but you can't claim it. So what do you do? Thank you. Thanks, mate. We lost the ticket. We came in out of beer. We walked outside and we just looked out, looked everywhere. But just looking wasn't going to get the money back, and neither was one more bet. There was nothing for it but to cut their losses and head off home. And that's where fate dealt Bob and Steve a hand in a million. Out of the tens of thousands of tickets lying around, out of the millions of places a ticket might land, the one ticket Bob and Steve needed found the one spot they couldn't miss. It was a windy day and the ticket blew up on me foot. I bent down, picked it up and said, hey, Bob, this is a ticket. We're blessed. OK. And so we went and had another beer. <laughs> Who said fate was cruel? The story of a young Aboriginal boy, cursed by his own people. There is a tribal law in every tribe that if you break the law, you get punished for it. And beyond the help of modern medicine. It sort of led me to believe what I'd been thinking all along, that this, um, this young man had been, been sung. It was then at this stage, after he'd been talking to that, he suddenly sat straight up in bed. He just sat bolt upright and he screamed. And all he said was, I've got one minute to live. An untold story, next week. That's all we've got time for tonight. Just before we go, I'd like to show you something else from next week's show. It's a story about two of the most amazing people you'll ever meet. Alison Holloway has their story from London. The twins insist on doing everything together and must be able to see each other at all times. If separated even for a moment, they become hysterical. They even try to walk in step. Today, they're so close that they sleep in a double bed. Pour boiling water from a kettle while both hold the handle. And dress identically 